Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, Antoine and Freddy, for inviting me to this beautiful place. Um, I wasn't expecting to give this lecture, actually. Uh, I think on Friday, Freddy called me up and said, uh, can you give another lecture? I said, mm, I suppose so. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, a general lecture on climate. Uh, and, uh, uh, and he said, it's an hour and a half. <laughs> And we'll double your speaking fee. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't actually say that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, it went from zero to zero, uh, so two times zero. So, um, uh, so anyway, uh, wait, it sounded like from what I heard that you'd had lots of sort of focus talks, you know, on things like convective turbulence and GFD and ocean MOC, but nothing uh, very general. Uh, so this is about as general as you can get. In fact, the first half of it, because I've kind of put this together from existing slides, the first half of it is actually a public lecture that I gave um, in Seattle a couple of years ago when I was visiting University of Washington. So it's fairly non-technical, um, but hopefully uh, that's okay. Sometimes I actually like being reminded of the big picture now and again. And it's, uh, it's kind of the only way that I can maintain my enthusiasm for the subject. I mean, to give me a little bit of biography, I was in fact at Princeton and GFDL for about 15 years, a colleague of Isaac, and we talked, we talked uh, quite a lot about uh, hierarchies and the big picture and so on. So, um, uh, but thinking about the big picture is what keeps me motivated, although I didn't actually get into global warming until, uh, that wasn't my motivation um, for getting into the field. I kind of, um, well, I still do divide my time between oceanography and meteorology, about 50-50. And, uh, is this going to work? Oh, yeah. So getting into global warming, uh, it's kind of a field, some people almost, you know, poo-poo, you know, I'm not going to do global warming, it's far too trendy or something. Uh, <laughs> but I realize that just because a problem is important, that's not a reason to not study it, <laughs> uh, which I think sometimes we have this um, notion that we can't do it uh, because everyone else is doing it. Um, you know. They're like Yogi Berra, this, uh, you know, uh, might, might have said nobody studies global warming uh, anymore because everybody else is studying it. Um, but anyway, here's, um, it certainly excites passions in the general field. Um, the Daily Express, Britain's finest newspaper. Um, a few headlines from a few years ago, snow chaos, and they still claim it's global warming. <laughs> the big climate change fraud. A hundred weas actually this is this could be almost uh, a reasonable headline. A hundred reasons why climate global warming is natural. Um, and that's not a not a stupid headline, as, as we'll come to see in a minute. Um, but uh, a few more. No global warming in North America. Um, from somewhere. Here's c slightly the opposite. Global, global warming is a hoax, or so claim well-funded naysayers who still reject the overwhelming evidence. So things go both ways, and it can be exaggerated. You think this is hot, get used to it. Uh, more signs of global warming. Uh, the final warning. Uh, and here we are, I like this one. Soon palm trees will dot Antarctica. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so it goes both ways, obviously. And, um, and here we are, I like these ones too. East Coast blizzard tied to climate change. And it, and it may well be, I mean, everything ultimately is perhaps tied to climate change. But, um, Anyway, that's what I'm going to talk about. 
um, in this uh, general style. And if you have any questions, just, just shout as I go along. Um, yeah, you might have seen quite a few of these things before, uh, of course, I expect. But um, talk about forcings versus feedbacks. What causes global warming? A quote-unquote forcing. What amplifies or diminishes it a feedback? How certain are we? Is it happening? Could it just be natural variability? When will it happen? How big would it be? You know, now or next century or next millennia? How sure are we? And then toward the end, I'll talk a little bit about dynamics versus thermodynamics, uh, depending on time. And here's a little bit more sort of technical in a sense, because one of my theses will be that a lot of the things that we are actually certain about are directly tied to the thermodynamics. So we actually know temperature will go up. Uh, temperature goes up. We know the lapse rate will change fairly certainly. We know that it might cause diminution of sea ice. So we know all of those things. There's ever uncertainties in them. We know the signs. Some of the dynamical effects of that, like whether the Hadley cell will expand or whether the westerlies will shift, uh, we're much more uncertain about. And even the sign of some of them uh, is a little bit un, uh, unsure. So, is it real? Um, so just the facts, uh, no interpretation at the moment. Um, so what we know is that, and I'll show a bit more details about these things as we go along, uh, temperature has gone up and will continue to go up. We can't, um, it would be extraordinarily perverse uh, for the increase in temperature not to have been associated with the increase in greenhouse gases. Um, you can make an argument for that, uh, but you really have to go into contortions. It would be sort of the opposite of Occam's razor, which would seek the, uh, the simplest solution. It's almost certainly not natural variability. It is caused by increased greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, and those, that carbon dioxide is of anthropogenic, meaning human-caused origin, i.e. fossil fuels. We know that too. None of that is controversial at all. Um, this is actually the temperature record from, um, there's two or three organizations in the world uh, that produce charts like this. I think NOAA does one. There's one uh, comes out of the UK Met Office uh, and University of East Anglia. And if you plot them on top of each other, they almost, uh, they look very similar to each other. So here it is going up. It's gone up now about one degree Celsius uh, over the last 120 or so years. Um, fairly big increases in the first part of the 20th century, then this sort of long hiatus from about 1945 to 75. A rapid increase again in the last 20 or so years of the 20th century, and then a little bit of a hiatus again, which maybe we're just coming out of now, of, uh, of almost 20 years, uh, where the temperature has been relatively flat. Uh, and now it seems like, although I can't be absolutely sure, the temperature is starting to rise again. Uh, lots of fluctuations um, along the way. But, um, but global average temperatures, it's certainly not everything that one is concerned about, but it's sort of um, it's the basis for concern because a lot of things will scale with the increase in temperature. Uh, so it, it is the basis, uh, uh, the basis for concern. This is actually the um, slightly old plot. It doesn't have the last few years. But these, the pale blue-green lines, were predictions from a bunch of models 
uh, from the last uh, IPCC report uh, and this black line is the temperature so you can see that um, prior to uh, about 2000 the models were predicting a more or less steady increase and this is the hiatus that people have been concerned about and that there's been a lot of um, effort involved in trying to uh, figure out where that comes from um, almost certainly comes from some form or another of natural variability but I don't think we know the exact causes um, probably ocean heat uptake um, somewhere or another putting it in perspective uh, here's the same plot you saw be before this is the so-called um, hockey stick plot it kind of looks like a hockey stick um, these are temperatures going back about a thousand years um, up here it's the actual instrumental record um, as you go further back in time these are mainly proxy records from tree rings largely other things too this is sometimes called the little ice age um, period from about 1600 to 1800 where it was relatively cool uh, particularly in northern Europe and then started to increase fairly rapidly this is sometimes called the medieval warm period and um, I was once giving a lecture on geostrophic turbulence in Santa Barbara and I had this plot right at the beginning of my talk and I was going to take it out because it wasn't really relevant to the talk but I happened to see a, a hockey stick next an actual hockey stick next to the blackboard so I thought well I can't take it out now because I have this hockey stick I can actually <laughs> put it up next to it and uh, that turned out to have been a big mistake <laughs> because uh, a fellow called Michael McIntyre was in the audience if some of you may know and uh, I immediately got into about a 15 minute distracting conversation with Michael about uh, uh, how appropriate it was and so on but um, but, uh, but anyway it's called a hockey stick I think Jerry Marlman from GFGO invented that name but it's it kind of looks like a hockey stick and I think one of the things about global warming whether or not you think that it's been just as warm now it certainly has been as warm now in, in the long time past perhaps it, it was even as warm a thousand years ago but the rapidity of the increase uh, has been unprecedented as, fa as far as I know um, here's some reconstructions which actually go back uh, a lot further about 2,000 years uh, again here's a global warming signal here's their estimate uh, of the errors but, uh, but that increase that rapid increase is certainly uh, haven't seen that before um, okay is that an artifact of urban growth um, oftentimes given as a um, but almost certainly not um, here are two temperature records um, this one surface temperatures largely taken with um, thermometers including a lot of thermometers in cities um, this um, a collection of lower troposphere measurements largely taken from satellites uh, without any particular concentration over cities um, and they look actually uh, fairly simple the um, fairly similar thickness of the gray line uh, is a measure of um, the uncertainty perhaps or the error in some of these and you can see well a fairly steady warming uh, from about 1970 up to about 2000 here are um, this is an El Nino uh, there were about two or 
three two big El Ninos in this period, one here, one in about 1981. El Ninos tend to warm the global average temperature temporarily by about half a degree Celsius. Um, they're bringing a lot of warm water to the surface in the um, eastern tropical Pacific. Uh, and then it subsides again, but here are the signals. Um, volcanoes are generally considered to cool the climate uh, by a similar amount over a similar period because they're spewing up aerosols uh, which are reflecting solar radiation. Um, although they're a bit, little bit harder to actually see them in the record if you actually because there's certainly many ups and downs in the record not associated with volcanoes. Um, some of them have actually, uh, well, Pinatubo, the timing is, um, well, I guess you can, you can see a certainly a downswing here. Uh, not so much with El Chichon. Agung was a fairly big volcano in about 1963 seems to have been a big downturn in uh, after that. So uh, anyway, the fact that it's, it's, uh, you see the warming uh, everywhere is certainly not, a, not an urban artifact, as we are sometimes led to believe. Uh, here's some patterns of global warming um, from, I think, the previous generation of, of uh, GCMs. Um, two things, I think, two qualitative things to note. Uh, global warming tends to be amplified at high latitudes, uh, near the surface anyway, so-called polar amplification, and it's by and large amplified over land. Um, so this is the um, temperatures around about the turn of the century minus the means between 1940 and 1980. So this is actually observed uh, temperature increase. Um, so people like to um, quantify uh, global warming by talking about climate sensitivity, um, which is generally conveniently defined as the response of the global average surface temperature to a doubling in the carbon dioxide uh, concentration of the atmosphere. So um, we double it, uh, all of a sudden we wait to see what happens, uh, measure the increase in surface temperature, and that's the, that's the climate sensitivity. Um, come back to that uh, a little bit more. Um, one reason we talk about climate sensitivity of carbon dioxide is that carbon dioxide's radiated properties have been quite well studied. Um, and it has a more or less a logarithmic effect upon the radiated balance. So the increase in the forcing due to carbon dioxide is it actually is logarithmic. And more or less uh, radiated calculations uh, give us this relationship. Uh, the logarithm of the CO2 level that you have divided by the carbon dioxide level of some, uh, some reference level, typically pre-industrial. Um, so for doubling carbon dioxide, um, it's 5.5 log 2, and that's about 3.5 degrees Celsius. Uh, so sorry, three and a half watts per square meter. So you get about a three and a half watts per square meter extra forcing from doubling carbon dioxide. And then if there were no feedbacks, you could actually calculate the um, climate sensitivity just using a purely radiative calculation. Uh, and radiative calculations are actually highly accurate, especially in clear sky. Uh, clouds are another complication, but it would be 
a calculation of this ilk, but it would be more complicated because it's not just a black body. But if you think of delta times sigma t to the fourth, change in sigma t to the fourth, where t is some temperature, delta f is the change in forcing. This gives you um, a ballpark figure as to what a doubling in CO2 will be. So uh, you just do this calculation for delta F of about uh, three and a half watts per square meter. And you get a delta T of about 1.1 degrees Celsius. Um, so that's a figure that you can just um, kind of hang on to. Uh, it would be very weird if the increase in temperature due to a doubling in CO2 were an order of magnitude different from this. I mean, it could be double this or even treble this, maybe even four times this. Uh, but it would be pretty, you'd be shocked if it was 10 times this or if it were a tenth of this. It's going to be of, of this order. Um, but it's understanding, I guess, what all of these feedbacks are, which is the, the you know, the problem of global warming. It's part of the, certainly it's a thermodynamic part of the problem, is to understand how these might be amplified or diminished by things like clouds, moisture, and so on. Um, and uh, climate sensitivity is a part, a function of time scale, which we'll come to in a, in a minute. Um, Okay, so what causes it? Um, still just being factual. Um, here's a, I guess this plot has bec now become somewhat iconic, partly because it's sort of nicely visual and it has numbers associated with it too, which, prob which may have changed. This one is from 1990. I'm always shocked that 1997 was now 20 years ago. Uh, anyway, uh, be that as it may, um, sort of the overall plot of the energy flow, global heat flows um, in the atmosphere. Incoming solar radiation, um, simple, just a purely astronomical calculation uh, or measurement gives you that it's about 342 watts per square meter. Um, somewhere along the lines of a little bit less than a quarter of that are reflected by clouds in the atmosphere. Um, about half of it makes it through to the surface, some is absorbed by the atmosphere. And then at the surface, uh, maybe about a sixth of what actually reaches the surface is reflected back. Uh, and goes out. Um, the outgoing long wave radiation is equal to the incoming solar radiation if you're in balance. Um, that's also true with, obviously also true, although we sometimes might forget it, it's also true after global warming, as soon as the atmosphere comes back into uh, equilibrium, the outgoing infrared radiation is still going to be the same as the net incoming solar radiation. That's not going to change. So in some sense, the um, although the surface is getting warmer, uh, because that's global warming, the net emitting temperature of the atmosphere is going to stay uh, pretty much the same as it is now. The emitting temperatures can be defined as sigma t emitting to the fourth is equal to the net incoming solar radiation. The net incoming solar radiation doesn't change. Um, it might change a little bit if clouds change, but it won't change a whole lot. Then the emitting temperature uh, will be the same. But um, it's going to get warmer at the surface. Um, here's the surface uh, energy balance. Uh, and a lot of what the surface 
receives is infrared radiation uh, from the atmosphere. That's according to this calculation, we're getting over 300 watts per square meter uh, of infrared radiation emitted from the atmosphere to the surface. Uh, so we're actually getting more IR radiation hitting the surface than we are solar radiation. And that's the, the greenhouse effect, the classical greenhouse effect, uh, if you will. Uh, and then at the surface, um, if you have surface balance, the downwards infrared radiation plus the downward solar radiation is going to be balanced by upward emission of infrared radiation plus the latent heat and sensible heat um, from the surface. So that's uh, that's uh, today's climate, more or less. Um, these figures change, as it were, on a decadal basis, not due to natural variability, but due to somebody making the measurements more accurately. Um, but um, that's a different kind of natural variability. Um, so, um, but it's, it, it's, it's more or less the same. And what's happened then over, this is um, maybe not at this summer school. Has anybody showed this figure before? Okay. Ge generally, <laughs> generally, it's the case that uh, you go to a conference and this figure gets shown 20 times. I was kind of hoping that this kind of conference. <laughs> uh, but anyway, here it is. Here's the famous Keeling curve. Um, um, largely Okay, so here's the Keeling curve. Um, gone up from about 290 was the pre-industrial level. It's actually over 400 now. Um, reached that peak a year or so ago. Uh, and these, you can see the little annual cycles here because there are more continents in the Northern Hemisphere than the Southern Hemisphere. So... Um, Carbon dioxide gets taken up by all the vegetation over land in the southern hem in the northern hemisphere spring. Um, so that's the breathing of the planet. And this going up is associated with these fossil fuels. Um, and uh, actually, you know, we know that it's come from the fossil fuels. Um, rather than some other source because uh, the carbon in fossil fuel burning has a slightly different isotopic composition. Different ratios of carbon-12 uh, and carbon-14 than does the natural carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, so you, measure, you can measure the isotopic composition uh, and it has the signature of burning fossil fuels. Uh, so it's not, is that a question of a wave? <laughs> I was wondering if the fluctuations have changed in amplitude these um, ones? over the years. I don't. I mean, de deforestation and. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, it, it might look ever so slightly smaller here. <laughs> 
from here. But but uh, but I uh, uh, seems. But I would I would guess not really. Um, our CO2 levels last week. I, I don't know when last week. Last week was not last week. <laughs> <laughs> last week was last week two years ago. Um, so um, here it is. Um, over the past uh, uh, thousand or so years, um, starting to go up uh, around about 1800. And this curve hasn't gone up. Uh, and here it is over the past few hundred thousand years, and it's a remarkable, um, it's a remarkable record. Um, by and large, not from proxies, a lot of it is from uh, drilling ice cores. You drill ice cores in Antarctica um, uh, and Greenland and you can actually measure the bubbles which have been trapped and you can age the cores quite well. Um, so you then you can actually look at the um, look at the levels of carbon dioxide in those ice cores and you get this record which is quite a, an amazing record, really, with this enormously strong 100,000-year cycle, which is another problem uh, in paleoclimate. Um, this is one of the records in paleoclimate that you can actually truly believe. Um, other, some other proxy records tend to be less reliable Somebody once said that nothing, nothing changes faster than paleo data, <laughs> uh, because of uh, all the interpretations. And one of, indeed, uh, as a little aside, one of these things has been um, uh, a lot of challenges in climate and paleo climate revolve around what the pole to equator temperature gradient was, and because um, that's one of the things we would really like to understand it's both a it's a zero order question in um, in climate dynamics and for a long time people argued that back in the early eocene about 50 million years ago there was data which suggested that the pole to equator temperature gradient was actually much smaller than it is now um, it was certainly very warm at high latitudes 60 million years ago that's Again, one of the unequivocal records of paleoclimate because people have actually found fossil evidence of crocodiles or crocodilians uh, wandering around in North Canada, uh, in Ellesmere Island in particular, and also some uh, fossil records of palm trees. And... Um, Crocodiles, even if you account for some evolutionary ad adaptation, they could not survive um, cold, extended cold winters. Um, and uh, so we certainly know it was warm then. Um, there were also seems to have been less certain evidence that at low latitudes the temperature wasn't much warmer than today. Uh, so there was a Pole to equator temperature gradient, according to some measurements, was about 20, up to 20 degrees Celsius less than today. Um, more recently, that's been questioned, and people have said, well, in fact, tropical temperatures were consistently more like 40 degrees Celsius uh, back then. So, but that's one of the, um, I think, in terms of low-hanging fruit. Uh, one of the climate problems, modulo not knowing what the which data to believe is to actually sort out some of these um, climate problems of the past. Because um, the crocodiles uh, roaming around in North Canada is not just a, a thermodynamic problem, it's also a dynamic problem about how the circulation can actually manage not to give 
cold continental winters. But okay, um, so that carbon dioxide here is actually a plot of uh, the actual emissions into the atmosphere, uh, global fossil carbon emissions, that's the total. Blue line is petroleum uh, and the green line is coal and that's mainly where it's come from, uh, petroleum and coal. So there's a lot of this. So if you do a budget, uh, you actually find that um, about twice as much carbon dioxide has been put into the atmosphere by fossil fuels uh, than actually exists now in the atmosphere. So uh, uh, of that difference, much of it has presumably gone in back into the uh, back into the ocean. So there's no shortage. There's no. The problem is not where's the carbon dioxide come from? The problem is, why isn't there more carbon dioxide um, in the atmosphere? Um, so, forcings and feedbacks, again, probably nothing new to you, but isn't water vapor the biggest greenhouse gas? And yes, it is by a, actually a fairly big margin. Um, so carbon dioxide isn't that important, and that's the argument where it goes wrong. Carbon dioxide is quite important. Not, uh, and that's because of feedbacks. Um, this is perhaps the easiest feedback to understand, um, is the ice albedo feedback. Um, is that if there's some initial change which gives you cooling for whatever reason. Uh, cooling will give you more snow and ice, high reflectivity, less solar radiation. So it gets even cooler. And so it, it goes round and round. Um, no, um, no problem there. The and you get a similar feedback with water vapor because of the very pretty powerful Clausius Clapeyron equation. These are solutions or approximate solutions of the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Just the this Clausius Clapeyron gives you the um, amount of water vapor that a, um, a given volume can hold. It doesn't need to be any air in that volume, it can just be a, a vacuum. Um, uh, but this gives you the saturated vapor pressure uh, beyond which um, you would expect condensation normally to occur. Um, so the maximum amount of water vapor increases more or less exponentially uh, with temperature. And um, in today's climate, it's going up by about 7% per degree. If you kind of look at the slope of this, Around about, around about here, um, about seven percent per degree, so twenty percent over three degrees, um, as I think Isaac mentioned. Um, so, as it gets warmer, uh, some initial change, more water, increased water vapor, increased greenhouse trapping, uh, increased warming, and so on, and um, and that's important and if some experiments done a few years ago uh, NASA um, diminished the amount of carbon dioxide kept on diminishing it and um, I can't remember their exact results um, but certainly if you take carbon dioxide levels to zero in the atmosphere you would actually expect a complete freezing over of the uh, of the globe, going into a a, a snowball Earth uh, with their results. Um, so that's the feedback, and it goes, you know, it goes both ways. Um, but the problem is when you have talk about things like cloud feedbacks. Um, there's no nice loop. <laughs> 
that you can draw saying if it increases then you get more clouds therefore it's warmer therefore blah blah um, and that's because clouds behave in different ways um, depending on you know low cloud um, might be a lot of reflection from low clouds but because they are low the greenhouse effect is relatively small so more low clouds would cool the earth um, on the other hand if you got more high clouds um, which might not have as high an albedo but certainly have a stronger greenhouse they could actually warm the earth and um, so depending on the distribution of, of cloudiness and, uh, and I'm not quite sure what would happen with thick cloud uh, so it's complicated and uh, generally um, different models have different behavior uh, because they all have different parameterizations of different detailed parameterizations of clouds um, and generally treatment in particular of strata cumulus is regarded as one of the largest contributors to different global warming um, effects uh, across different models uh, so that's that's one of the big uncertainties um, so with all these complicated loops or non loops maybe climate just varies naturally and um, and that and going back to this question you know that the Daily Express had there's a hundred ways that climate could vary naturally I mean so to ask the question could global warming not be natural variability I want to kind of emphasize that's not a stupid question can't you say oh no don't be stupid uh, <laughs> because it, it could um, and uh, but it probably doesn't and um, so you know how do we know it's not natural variability well I can't think of anything else it could be apart from force variability but that's a kind of a weak argument some kind called the argument from personal incredulity incredulity you can't think of anything else uh, but it's a sort of a weak argument but if you look for empirical evidence that it's not natural variability certainly the rapid increase that it's we've had recently uh, unprecedentedly rapid suggests that it's not natural variability otherwise you might have thought it would have occurred before um, although these rapid variations are strange things as Fedi uh, studies in a different context but if it were natural what would the mechanism be and the most credible mechanism for natural variability on say a hundred year time scale would be the ocean um, and um, because the atmosphere itself is forgetful um, it's hard you know people talk about climate regimes and atmospheric regimes and some people study them more than I do and some people I think have a bigger belief in them than I do um, certainly hard to imagine an some kind of atmospheric regime lasting for decades especially when you have a seasonal cycle because a seasonal cycle is much larger than any global warming cycle so almost certainly a seasonal cycle is going to knock something uh, knock you away from some warming regime I, I, w I would have thought um, so the year-to-year -year memory of the climate system resides mainly in the ocean and land certainly uh, ice sheets and so on have a very long time scale but the ocean itself can naturally vary on years decades centuries and millennia as I think probably maybe people have talked about but the meridional overturning circulation of the ocean has some natural time scale of a century or so um, so if it's going to vary it's going to vary on centuries or so um, gyres vary uh, on a decadal time scale 
but you can certainly imagine that um, the oceans might vary on, a, say, a centennial scale, and if they did, they might vary in such a way as to put heat into the atmosphere and warm the atmosphere, and that might be the cause of global warming. So I think that's the most credible mechanism of natural variability to explain global warming. So they would do it by giving heat up to the atmosphere, and hence they would cool. Um, it's a nice hypothesis, but it's actually doomed by the facts. Um, and here are actually measures of the ocean heat content um, over about the past 50 or so years. So apart from that slightly downward trend here, there's been a fairly upward trend in the ocean heat content, meaning the oceans have gotten warmer um, over the past 40 or so years. And actually, sea level has also gone up. And a good chunk of that sea level going up is to do with the fact that the oceans have actually, they actually expand. Uh, there's a thermal expansion coefficient of the ocean. Uh, so when they get warmer, they expand. Uh, so, and here's another record from uh, tide gauge records going back some 100 years uh, of sea level change, average sea level change going up about 20 centimeters. So that's fairly unequivocal empirical evidence that the oceans aren't giving up heat to the atmosphere. The oceans are warming because of global warming. So the oceans themselves are getting warmer because we're putting carbon dioxide and so on um, into, the, into the atmosphere. So, um, uh, so I think um, that's also f so fairly uncontroversial then too. So now let's get on to slightly more controversial or uncertain aspects. How much will climate warm? How certain are we? We kind of have to move beyond the facts and uh, hopefully we won't get into this burning earth scenario. But here are some, I think these projections are from the last but one IPCC report. The IPCC is this conglomerate of, um, of results uh, of an archive from all of the various modeling centers around the world. Um, and this is some, and I forget which scenario this one is from, but these are, are some of the main models of projections going up over the past, uh, over the next hundred or so years. And, uh, and here's an Another one, again from the last but one IPCC, uh, with various of the scenarios um, and a certain amount of uncertainty. These are the mean uh, for different scenarios of putting different amounts of greenhouse gases and aerosols into the atmosphere. Um, and um, it's quite a lot of uncertainty, a bit less uncertainty as we go back, um, here it is again. The actual, the uncertainty of the eventual temperature rise due to carbon dioxide has diminished over only a little really over the past couple of decades. In fact, it's the range, it's a famous report by Charney, I uh, forget what dates that, that was. Um, back in the 60s, sorry, 70s, okay, China, when he talked about, or, or his group talked about the, um, the uncertainties for global warming, and the uncertainties he quoted are not much larger than the uncertainties given now. Uh, of course, that kind of lead some people to ask whether there's some kind of irreducible limit to the accuracy of our climate forecasts. And uh, 
it's kind of an interesting question too um, I mean we know that there is an irreducible limit to the time when we'll ab be able to do weather forecasts we, you know we're, we're pretty much certain you'll never be able to do a weather forecast in you know, a day-to-day -day prediction beyond about 15 days um, you know never ever uh, because the atmosphere is chaotic and small differences in initial conditions give rise to larger ones down the road the butterfly effect uh, and so on um, so that's known um, some people sort of in the applied math community have also argued that might be an irreducible limit to the accuracy of our climate forecasts um, not for that reason but because there are so many feedbacks in the climate system there's a sort of irreducible errors in the feedbacks between convection and clouds and the dynamics uh, that uh, I'm not quite sure I believe this I think it's um, I think it's more of a matter of our own ignorance in understanding these feedbacks that we could if we were clever enough um, get it right in the end but we might not getting it right in the end might take us so long that global warming has already happened so I think we could do it I'm reminded again a little aside of a phrase from Andrew Wiles Andrew Wiles proved Fermat's last theorem and apparently apparently he actually said this he was he said um, I always thought I could prove Fermat's theorem I just wasn't sure I could do it in my lifetime <laughs> so, uh, which is sort of sort of interesting uh, in a way anyway I, I think we can probably reduce these uncertainties down to um, down to the thick lines but I'm not sure we can do it before they actually happen um, and uh, certainly models get it right in the past and part of the reasons they get it right in the past is because models work by a cancellation of error um, there's tuning going on implicitly or explicitly um, and uh, one measure of that is that models uh, which had a lot of aerosols in them aerosols have tended to reduce the warming um, models which had a lot of aerosols in them tend to give higher sensitivity in the future because for the future warming you've specified the aerosol level so they all have to do uh, the same with the aerosols but um, models in a sense implicitly or explicitly models that are highly sensitive uh, got the answer right here by having more aerosols in them and um, so uh, and here are some also some predictions of sea level rise again very and of course sea level rise is one of the main things which people are concerned about uh, the variations 20 centimeters to 60 centimeters is quite a lot um, of course it could be even more of the, the great ice sheets yeah can, can you just say a word about the models that are in this ensemble that are common point and I there are differences uh, actually I can't really say much I mean these are all pretty much full physics models the uh, general circulation models from GFDL had CM2 which is the Met Office climate model 2 DOI model um, CSIRO model is from Australia ECM is a Hamburg model um, there's a whole business in a sense trying to deconstruct why the models differ from each other in these projections and uh, as I mentioned earlier I think certainly many people believe that the difference in these projections a large amount of it stems from what they are predicting for low cloud amounts um, 
but they're all they're all big models. Um, these are some of the sea level risks on the east coast. Um, uh, height above sea level. See, so where it's black and red, not much above sea level. So a relatively small amount of rise in sea level could have quite large effects in South Florida. And um, uh, so, of course, that's another another danger. Of course, not this doesn't include anything to do with the ice sheets melting. If the Greenland ice sheet melted, you'd have about seven meters of sea level rise. Um, that's not going to happen in our lifetimes. Um, but uh, people have, indeed, I'm not an ice sheet expert, um, so I can't comment on the credibility of this. Uh, but some people who know more claim that it's almost inevitable now that the Greenland ice sheet will melt. Um, uh, sort of no matter what we do. Um, there's already been enough, and that especially with the warming that almost certainly will occur over the next 50 or so years uh, to melt it. And um, and you see in the news there was a um, an ice sheet broke off from the Antarctic Peninsula the other a uh, couple of weeks ago, and this one was the size of Delaware, state in the U.S. And you can always judge, you know, the state's getting bigger. There used to be an ice sheet the size of Rhode Island has broken off. <laughs> <laughs> now it's an ice sheet the size of Delaware. And uh, I don't know whether we'll have, in the next one will be two Delawares or whether they'll go up to a new, you know, New Jersey will be next. Um, kind of interesting. I mean, I have no idea how big Delaware is, so it didn't really help me, this. <laughs> so, but anyway, it was Del Delaware was the state quoted in all of the news. Half the size of Wales. Ah, okay, that, was, that's, uh, that helps. <laughs> <laughs> Delaware is half the size of Wales. And Wales, from, that's probably s half the size of Belgium, too, maybe somewhere like that. Anyway. Um, okay, so um, one of the, um, here's the observed temperature increase, and that's, this is the, f as it were, the forcing giving rise to it, the increase in greenhouse gases. Um, and its uncertainty, going back from about 1900 to the present day, these are par particular estimates of the forcing from various groups. Um, and uh, the gray line is a sort of measure of the uncertainty of, of this, which actually increases over time, in a sense rather than decreases, because if you go back to 1890, there was no uncertainty in the change of the forcing. That was before we started putting in lots of greenhouse effects and aerosols into the atmosphere. So this is a, uh, a measure of the uncertainty. And, uh, and we get these big dips. These forcings are volcanoes. This is Agung here. And this is Pinatubo, I presume, here. Um, so that's the uncertainty. If we didn't have any uncertainty in the forcing, you could probably get a pretty good estimate of what the future warming was going to be, modulo sort of nonlinear effects, just by fitting it uh, to the past. So and uh, Geoff, maybe it would be useful to define precisely what F is. Because it's uh, it seems obvious, but maybe it's it's not so obvious. If you um, maybe the next equation will help. Or this equation would help. Um, if the atmosphere, if the climate system obeyed this equation, forget what 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 this is. Uh, this is a heat capacity. This is the, f the forcing, um, the increase in the 
due to the increased carbon dioxide. This is the increased uh, infrared emission. Um, so uh, this forcing is the increased uh, infrared radiation, the increased greenhouse effect. The number of additional watts per square meter you would get at the same temperature by increasing the amount of the greenhouse gas. So, uh, so here it is again. Carbon dioxide is increasing. Um, aerosols are actually decreasing the forcing because they're reflecting the solar radiation back. So this is uh, the main uncertainty is actually due to the aerosol forcing. Um, and so you can imagine just trying to fit the, um, the climate of the past 100 years or so to a simple climate model like this. This is about the simplest climate model you could imagine. Um, C is the heat capacity, dt, dt, the temperature change, F is the forcing, lambda, delta t um, is the damping, and W dot would be just some natural variability. Um, so, and it turns out you can actually fit the global temperature fairly well to a model like this. And if you know, um, and the main uncertainty is this uncertainty in the forcing, and that translates to an uncertainty in the climate sensitivity. Lambda is essentially the climate sensitivity because if you're in steady state and you ignore this term, the change in temperature is F divided by lambda. Uh, so the lambda is a measure of the climate sensitivity. Uh, if you actually to write it as one over lambda in this equation. Um, so you would wha wha what is the, is it the top of the troposphere temperature or the surface uh, temperature? T or sorry, T is the surface temperature. T is the surface temperature. Yeah. Um, so we did that. Um, and these are a couple of estimates. You can almost, doesn't really matter how you actually do it. Um, but basically you're fitting this equation Um, to this forcing which has got all of the greenhouse gases and the aerosols in there with, an, with this error here you're fitting that model to that forcing and you know what the temperature actually has been over the past um, 100 years because the actual temperature has been this that's your forcing with errors. So fitting that equation to that time series gives you a measure of the uncertainty of lambda just from the last 100 or so years of temperature uh, record. And um, skipping through the, the ways of doing that, it gives you an actual um, plot of the range of the uncertainty of the temperature rise due, due to a doubling of CO2 purely from the past 100 years of climate record plus an estimate of the uncertainty in that forcing. Um, and you get various different results depending upon what values you take for this C which is the heat capacity of the surface, right? So we're just fitting this equation to the past 100 years of climate data uh, with, with an uncertainty in the forcing, and that gives us a values of the climate sensitivity lambda, which we then translate to a climate sensitivity, which will be the temperature increase due to a doubling in CO2. So that rather simple model gives you a climate sensitivity 
with a maximum probability of about 1.6 1 Celsius, which is actually somewhat lower than some other estimates uh, of climate sensitivity. Um, and it's in particular, well, it's, it's, it's also need to distinguish here between what people call the transient climate sensitivity and the equilibrium climate sensitivity. So you'll often get quoted, and this is, was back in the Charney report, that the range of climate sensitivities, and you still see this, was between about 2 degrees and 6 degrees Celsius. Uh, and that was for the equilibrium climate sensitivity. This actually is really talking about the transient climate sensitivity, which I'll um, uh, which is a slightly different um, measure. Um, the transient climate sensitivity is more or less how quickly is what will the response be after, say, a decade after you've doubled after you've doubled CO2. Then, if you wait another thousand years, it will keep on warming after that. And that's the equilibrium climate sensitivity. Um, so how long will it take? It's kind of going to ap approach that problem now. And how will it cool it da down again when we run out of fossil fuels? Uh, this is what I was talking about um, uh, a minute ago. This is actually from a paper of Isaacs. When you double uh, carbon dioxide, all of a sudden, uh, and you double it, and its temperature increases on a time scale of less than a decade. And then it, uh, then you hold carbon dioxide at a doubled level. What actually happens, or well it's not shown here, the temperature keeps on going up, and it's up there eventually. Um, um, and this. This temperature increase really corresponds to the atmosphere coming into equilibrium and just the upper 100 or so meters or less uh, of the ocean, namely the mixed layer. Um, and um, well, I say here, we know that this the ocean will take centuries to equilibrate from simple calorific considerations. It will take a, l a long, long time for the actual ocean to warm up. Um, even if the meridional overturning circulation is taking that heat down into the atmosphere, down into the deep ocean, it will take hundreds of years to fully ventilate. So it's kind of suggesting that the ocean, in a sense, has a fast response, which is just this mixed layer, and many, and a slow response, or many slow responses, in fact. And this fast time scale is just the time scale it takes really this mixed layer to equilibrate. If you look at the ocean, um, the plot of temperature in the ocean is oftentimes almost constant over the top 50 meters. Then it diminishes into the abyss. So the time scale for this part to equilibrate is much faster than the time scale for the deep ocean to equilibrate. And um, and you can actually model that with a um, this kind of two box model of the ocean, which goes back to Jonathan Gregory and others. Uh, we just have a mixed layer um, and just do a simple kind of energy balance model for the mixed layer. Um, it's got exchange with the atmosphere and the deep ocean, and the and the deep ocean just exchanges with the mixed layer, so that's its equation. T deep for deep, M for mixed layer, um, and uh, so on a decadal time scales, or or longer, perhaps centennial time scales. The deep ocean doesn't change its temperature. 
So TD is zero. These are perturbation temperatures. So you get this equa equation uh, for the mixed layer, where this lambda here is lambda 1 plus lambda 2. Um, so that actually gives you a lower climate sensitivity um, on small time scales because it just increases, and it's essentially just going back to this figure, it increases rapidly. Um, so that's the climate sensitivity on rapid time scales, which is about, in this model, about one and a half degrees. And then it increases on very long time scales, uh, which is the equilibrium climate sensitivity. And, uh, and if you take just take this two box model, for example, and do the same kind of experiments that we that uh, were done with a full GCM, you get similar kinds of results. That if you increase the forcing um, in a two box model, if you suddenly increase it, temperature goes up very quickly, and then it sort of goes along like that. Um, if you increase it more like what we are doing ourselves N now we're in putting carbon dioxide in at about one percent increase per year so it doubles over 70 years that's really not much different from a from an instantaneous doubling in terms of the long time scale it takes to get to uh, to equilibrium um, so um, so what we're really s seeing so in those other calculations I, I showed when we were trying to get a climate sensitivity by fitting to the last hundred years, what we're getting there is the transient climate sensitivity, the response to a, uh, the immediate response to a doubling in carbon dioxide. So you might say, well, it's really the equilibrium response we should be interested in, isn't it? because we're interested in the long term. In fact, really we should only care about the transient response um, for two reasons. And I'm saying this as a certainty, this is sort of more my opinion. I don't think everybody else would agree with this. Um, well, first off, the reason is who knows what will happen in a thousand years? Uh, you know, economists call that discounting. You just don't, you just don't know what will happen. What will happen to technology in a thousand years? I mean, look where we were a thousand years ago. Secondly, we may never actually see the equilibrium climate response because, um, as this graph shows some work I did with the postdocs. I don't think we ever, I think it's still in prep. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't think we ever, this ever got published. The, um, because here was some experiments with a s s somewhat idealized but coupled model. Um, and um, it says, gigatons. This is the carbon dioxide that was put into the atmosphere in a model. Um, so started about 1900 putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Then um, I forget which year. It's about the year 2020 or so in this simulation. The Increase CO2 emissions were cut to zero in this simulation to stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, so, so then what actually happens to the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is going up and up and up because we're putting carbon dioxide into it. Then when we stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, the actual carbon dioxide levels then start to diminish. Okay, 
they start to diminish because we're not putting any carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and it can now get absorbed largely by the ocean, I think entirely by the ocean uh, in this model. Um, so then you have two effects going on. And these two effects seem to more or less cancel. That uh, if you look at the temperature, the temperature is going up to this level here. And then um, this is the transient response. And then it, the temperature would like to keep on going up because it would like to keep on going up to reach its equilibrium value at that level of carbon dioxide. So it wants to go up to reach the equilibrium level, which might be, uh, you know, three or four degrees higher. But at the same time, the carbon dioxide level is coming down, um, which would tend to be a, a, a cooling, um, a cooling process. So the net effect is that the global temperature almost stays about the same that it was uh, when carbon dioxide was stopped being put into the atmosphere. Uh, yeah, okay, I say that, I say that here. Uh, the temperature stays more or less constant when emissions cease. Uh, and essentially, if you will, uh, carbon dioxide is being absorbed into the ocean about the same rate as the heat is being absorbed into the ocean. These effects cancel. Uh, and the global temperature stays about the same. So the fact that they exactly cancel is, is a matter of probably of parameters in your model. The, the matter that they exactly cancel, yeah. I think, um, I think that they... Yeah, I thought for a while they would magically, they had to magically cancel. Uh, but I don't think they have to magically cancel. Um, but they do have to be within that sort of wedge, um, which will be uh, more or less constant. Um, so in a sense, people talk about committed warming um, being, they say, well, this is the warming that will happen no matter what we do to the future emissions. Um, I don't think there really is any committed warming because if we were actually to stop putting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, uh, we probably would not get very much more warming uh, at all. Um, so, therefore, I mean, we know, therefore, we will never actually reach the, cli the equilibrium climate response um, because we'll actually run out of fossil fuels uh, before that. Uh, so that's just kind of the good news, <laughs> uh, is that we will run out of fossil fuels. Good, you know, it's all good, bad, isn't it? Um, you know, there's a lot of coal in the ground. Um, so the good news is we'll never reach the uh, equilibrium response. The bad news is that, in a sense, if we do use all the fossil fuels, that's not just a doubling of carbon dioxide. It's more like a, well six tupling something like that so this is sort of the uh, the scenario that one might imagine um, actually happening is that carbon dioxide levels go up it's kind of an idealized scenario this is the actual carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere they're going up and up now we can, might imagine that at around 2100 we get our acting gear so we're still putting them in but we're putting them in at a much lower rate and the actual carbon dioxide level is staying the same. It's entirely speculative. <laughs> I shouldn't even be re having this recorded. Uh, and then carbon dioxide level stays constant. Temperature's going up all this time. Once carbon dioxide levels equilibrate at some level, temperature keeps on increasing, trying to get to its equilibrium level. Here, at some time, who knows when, 2300 in this plot, we actually stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The carbon dioxide diminishes again, and the 
and the level temperature actually falls. But um, but this temperature here is just the transient climate response when we stop putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Then over the course of thousands of years it diminishes again. And carbon experts say that it won't actually ever come back to this level. That's on a million year time scale because we have to reform all the coal deposits uh, for that to happen. So how much warming will there ultimately be? Uh, oh, you can get various estimates from, okay, all right. So I'm not gonna do the second part of the talk at all. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll show one slide. Um, I'll show one slide on that. The, uh, there's quite a lot of known reserves BP produces a report. Um, pardon? Five minutes and then questions. Yeah, okay. So maybe a quad quadrupling uh, oops, of, of, of CO2 levels. Um, who's to blame? Uh, uh, who knows who's to blame? Uh, China and the US are putting a lot in. That's for sure. Um, there's lots of ethical questions about who gets the right to put to put it in. Some people argue China actually has more right to put CO2 in than the US because there are more people in China. Therefore, sort of each person has a certain amount they are ethically allowed to put into the atmosphere you could argue. That's a, um, yeah, so each country, should they be allowed to emit the same CO2 per person? Um, who knows um, what the answer to that is. It's, it's impossible to answer. And here's one reason why you can't answer that question. Suppose instead one country decides to reduce its total fossil fuel emissions by over time reducing its population. <laughs> They instigate birth control measures. The other country doesn't. So they're being a bit less responsible. So should this country not be allowed to emit more carbon dioxide per person than the other country? So uh, these are unanswerable questions, I think. And um, uh, I think it doesn't. So, so OK, finishing up. <laughs> So if we come back then to comparing China and the US, for instance, yeah, yeah, it turns out that uh, even with this argument, it goes in the same direction. I mean, that China should be allowed to emit more because they are first because they are more Chinese than US people, yeah. and second because they are actually tr they are trying try to curb uh, they the are the trying the natality. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure it's an argument one can answer because maybe they're not. They didn't try hard enough early on. <laughs> <laughs> so um, <laughs> uh, now they finally realize and they are trying, but you know, too little too late. I don't know. I think, um, <laughs> well, you can see the arguments that one gets into, or of discussions, at least. We're not yet arguing. Um, and uh, so I think it's, um, those are perhaps even harder than so, okay, as I say, the good news is doubling CO2. I think climate sensitivity is probably possibly less than two, s but hard to know. Once CO2 emissions halt, temperature no longer increases. Um, bad news is that burning all the oil and coal could easily get four or more. Um, and, the and, and once you get into these, levels of above four degrees Celsius, you're kind of, your arguments based on the past century become a little bit less secure because you're starting to get other feedbacks once you're above four degrees Celsius. Uh, you know, you'll get um, 
ISO Beto feedbacks, cloud unknown cloud feedbacks, and so on. So, um, uh, so these are, are, are much more uncertain. And when ash sheets could melt and it could be catastrophic. So, um, so my kind of personal view on this is in the short term, it's a smaller problem and sometimes apparent. In the longer term, it's po possibly a, a bigger problem than uh, sometimes opined. And, um, and that's, I think, about, uh, about it. And I'll, I'll skip all of the, the dynamics. I'll just show you one slide about the dynamics, which I was going to get to. But obviously, got didn't time the talk very well. But uh, oh, yeah, here's just one slide. I'll just show you one slide here. Um, so the uncertainties, in some ways, are even stronger with the dynamics. This is from the last scenario, RCP, uh, the large scenario, a lot of increased greenhouse gases. Each dot here is a model. So this is the expansion of the Hadley cell. This is from a paper about a year or two ago now. Um, each dot is the expansion of, the, of a Hadley cell over about the next 70 years um, in degrees. And first off, there's a lot of scatter. Then you think, OK, the scatter's not all that much. In the Northern Hemisphere, for example, the Hadley cell is increasing by about half a degree. Not too much variation. Here's a lot of scatter. But what I've plotted here is the actual global warming predicted by each model. So some models predict a very large amount of global warming, s some not very much. But the actual scatter, the actual expansion of the Hadley cell in all of these models, not only is there a fair amount of scatter, but it's not actually correlated with the amount of warming of each model. So the models with more warming don't necessarily predict more expansion of the Hadley cell. So the uh, uh, the other part of my thesis was even though the thermodynamic effects, there's uncertainty there, there's actually more uncertainty in the dynamical, some of the dynamical consequences. And the movement of the westerlies is even more uncertain. Some models predict polewards moving of the westerlies. A few have the westerlies in mid-latitudes moving equatorward with global warming. So there's even some sign, uncertainty about the sign there. So um, anyway. Thanks. Uh, so, the with regard to expansion of Hadley cell, yeah. do you think it's because in the southern hemisphere, ocean is play is playing yeah. like a damping role? Well, it's larger in the southern hemisphere, by and large. Um, so, y and you've got a larger spread. Um, so, so, to be honest, I don't know why. That a, I don't know. I mean, there's obviously a lot more continents in the northern hemisphere. Um, these are the. This is the annual average results. Um, the Hadley cell is complicated for. Um, it's also large, there are large seasonal effects in the Hadley cell. So doing the annual average, um, as I've done here, can be a little bit misleading because the summer Hadley cell is a quite a different beast than the, than the winter Hadley cell. Um, and in the Northern Hemisphere, the summer Hadley cell gets tied up with the monsoons. Uh, so in a sense, I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised that there are differences between Northern Hemisphere and Southern Hemisphere, but I don't know what the causes of those differences is. Well, uh, what's the story behind John Malkovich on your Who's to Blame? Story? Oh, <laughs> well, th yeah, that's actually given this. I never Malkovich, Malkovich. I actually got that picture of uh, on the web, and uh, 
I didn't know it was John Malkovich, and then somebody in the audience said, w what's the story about John Malkovich? So it just happened to be a picture I had with had lots and lots of people. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so um, it, just, it was a, just a convenient picture with, with lots, lots of humanity. And then somebody said, this is John Malkovich. Uh, so, so uh, I, yeah, yeah. We'll have to be careful with slides you show in a, in a talk. So earlier you brought up the polar... Where's the... Oh, there. Oh, yeah. There yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you <go> again. <laughs> <laughs> so earlier you brought up the polar uh, amplification, but there is a clear contrast between the northern and the southern yeah. poles. Do we have a good understanding about the contrast? Well, I think we know... Uh, um, it's way back here. I mean, I again, you would expect there to be a difference, and... Uh, because, because of, uh, uh, I don't know where it was. Oh, have I missed it? Oh, actually, oh here, yeah. Also, um, well, you've over here. Uh, certainly, you've got. Um, Antarctica is a high continent, um, and the ice isn't isn't diminishing here. You've got a lot of warming here over the Antarctic Peninsula, and this is where the ice sheets uh, is is breaking off, uh, and so that's more akin to the northern hemisphere. Down here, uh, a you've got a a continent, which is can be a few thousand feet high in places, and uh, and you don't have sea ice having any amplification. So again, it's not surprising. Um, the cause of the polar amplification, and that's um, you can see it again in the oh, there it is again. Okay. Yeah, so the temperature response here, again, you see it here. Um, but I think that's largely the cause of the difference. A lot of people have, there's a lot of papers on the cause of this. Um, and part of it is ice albedo effects. Part of it is the fact that you get inversions here, low-level inversions here. You don't get them here. You see this little white spot here. There's actually no data there because that's on Antarctica up here. So I, I have another question about your John Malkovich slide. <laughs> okay. Can, can we see? Yeah, go on, well, go on. I'll find it eventually, but here it is. So <laughs> when have you prepared this slide? When have I, when have, when have I prepared this? Well, this slide... Two I years ago? A few years ago. So uh, I, I, I was wondering why do you have UK and then rest of Europe? <laughs> <laughs> well, we <laughs> well... Well, actually, it, it's um, yeah. I, I I think this actual graph. I did I did not pre prepare this particular graph, but we do have Germany separate too. Um, rest of Europe, yeah. I don't know. Sorry about uh, w yeah. Well, probably you know it might. Have, well, actually, I, I it may be that France is lower here because of all its nuclear uh, power stations. Okay. It's a good time to stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>